Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Community Platform. What is a way forward for the Muslim world? Is it liberalization or is it Islamization? And does it have to be either? Can both not work? Is it not possible for both of these values to live together? Let's find out. Two people who understand not only from the Pakistan context, but also the context that what, where we are living. Shanaz, Asalaamu Alaikum and welcome. Wa Alaikum Asalaam Anjum. Have you been on our community platform before? Uh, possibly some time ago. Yes. yes, yes. Well, it's good to have you. It's good to have you. And of course, everybody knows you. Majid, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Good to have you back. Majid, why can't the Muslim world <coughs> work with both? I mean, why can't we be liberal and be Muslim? Why can't you have Islamization and liberalization? Is there conflict between the two? I mean, these terms <clears throat> are coined from a worldview, which is a liberal worldview. So when we look at the word Islamization, that doesn't come from Islam itself. That comes from a Western philosophy of how they read the world. So they read the world from secular lens, that everything which is religious might be problematic, therefore it should be left to the private sphere and the private domain of an individual and shouldn't really interfere within state life and societal life <clears throat> unless it's private like within a mosque or within a church or within a synagogue so the term Islamization is almost like this term which we're kind of uh, familiar with here in Britain today which is creeping Sharia where slowly slowly Islam is playing more of a dominant role or is trying to play more of a dominant role within a society and therefore it needs to be curbed back to its secular credentials so the, the term, you know, liberalization and Islamization, to be honest, they're not from Islam themselves, they're from a worldview, the world that we actually live in today, a globalized world where, you know, we are told that there are certain universal ideals and every country must subscribe to them. And that includes the Muslim world as well. So when they talk about freedom of speech, they say, why does the Muslim world have a problem with freedom of speech? You know, when it comes to um, human rights, you know, why can't a individual criticize a prophet like was done a long time ago in, in various countries in Bangladesh and Pakistan in in Jordan in various countries why can't they do that why can't they have the ability to say whatever they want without being shunned or looked down upon you know the religious lobby or the you know the 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 god squad like whatever they want to call it so um, that's why I think we need to approach this kind of discussion from a more of a like an independent and fresh perspective and drop the t drop these labels Basically, what you're saying is that these labels are very un unhelpful. Yeah, I think they're unhelpful because they don't really address any issue. They already have a, a predefined outcome. So they're already a... steering us towards a set debate, uh -huh. which is confined to these ideals. And what we need to do is we need to step out of that, and we need to look at it from a fresh so perspective. Be because I happen to be Pakistani heritage, if I was to look at the situation of Pakistan, um, where we assume it's democracy, um, can a country like Pakistan work with both? Can, can, can it work with both? Because it seems to be working with both. Or am I wrong? I mean, any country <coughs> needs to have a set mm. um, criterion from where all the judgments they come from. Mm -hmm. They need to have a way of life which resembles their belief system, their kind of like outlook on life. So a Western outlook of life and an Islamic outlook of life are... Contradictory? Contradictory, you can say to a certain extent, mm. they kind of oppose each other on, in, in many areas. So, um, a country like Pakistan is suffering at the moment because it hasn't really made a decision of which line it wants to take. Mm. So, you have uh, a secular government which conflicts with the founding ideology of Pakistan, which is Islam. You know, the people who migrated from India to Pakistan, if they wanted to remain secular, why did they migrate from one land to another in the first place? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make any sense. If they wanted to remain secular and just remain with their belief and wanted more security, they could have stayed back in India, but they didn't do that. So they migrated for a certain purpose, and you know we believe that purpose was for uh, a higher calling, which was there is a, a new destiny awaiting in a new area, and here we will have security as Muslims, and we would like to implement Islam. It didn't happen. Yeah, Shannon, Sh I want to come back because I know that uh, you do a lot of work in uh, both in Pakistan and UK. Uh, you're an educationalist yourself. Sometimes when I think about Pakistan, and I think if we had um, an Islamic, inverted commas, um, rule or what, whatever the system is, a lot of women when I speak to, uh, it frightens them. 
But the, Anjan, the question should be, why does it frighten them? Uh, as a Muslim woman, I am not frightened by Islam. Uh, so, what fr what, so what frightens these women? I think what frightens them is that there is an elite minority within Pakistan and they themselves are confused with the notion of democracy and the intertwined relationship between politics and religion. And when you are dictated, when you dictate to the masses an ideology that is not understood, not understood within the elite minority, never mind the masses, then that's when you have a, then so that's when you have a problem. And I think in a, in a country like Pakistan, where there are many problems, just as there are problems in, in this country, you must not forget that there are many problems here as well, that women themselves um, have got to ask that question, is where do they fit? Do they have a true understanding of what their identity is? And I just wanted to pick up on um, something that Majid just um, said. In this, uh, when you use words, or, or you coin words, or there are certain assumptions that are attached to words, I don't understand, or I ask the question, can you use um, Western ideology versus Islamic ideology? Because to me, it is Western ideology against Eastern ideology or Arabic ideology or African ideology, it, because you look at the world. Um, there is an assumption made that um, Western ideology has no religious background, mm. whereas historically, if you look at this country, um, the religious ideology of the state was very intertwined with the state itself. At the moment, we have head of state, and the head of state does not have any political say, as we understand, from, uh, mm. from an outside point of view, um, on the running of the country. Now, that, was, that wasn't long ago when that happened. No, Henry VIII. Henry VIII, and mm. why he did that, you know, history, history tells a story there. Mm. It was more to do with what he needed mm. and his power and, and how, how... Should have been a Muslim, he could have had four wives. Well, uh, possibly, <laughs> possibly, and that's a debate in itself. Uh, but I think he went beyond that. It was more to do with power and control and how to separate the two. So, me, uh, uh, as a... Uh, it doesn't, no, it, it doesn't frighten you. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't frighten me. And the reason why I ask this because all. I remember uh, recently when I was in Pakistan, um, I, I talked to a lot of women, mm. and I said, you know, you could have um, a country which is ruled and have regulations and have etiquettes. Mm. But what they said was they were not, as you said, they're not afraid of Islam, of course, but they are afraid of people who take over that role, Majid. Okay, and that's why. Um, any state which run, runs by or rules by Islam is a, is a human state. It's uh, the responsibilities of humans to execute, execute Islamic laws uh, upon the human population. So we're not talking about angels coming down and therefore somebody who is above the law. Yeah. Therefore people who are in these positions of authority, they have to be accountable and Islam places these uh, you know, checks and balances within the Islamic system for accountability. So whether you are somebody who is uh, uh, responsible for a certain district or for an entire uh, uh, area or for an entire state in a certain part of the, of the Muslim lands, you're, you're held accountable. And the Prophet wasallam he mentioned this quite explicitly when he said that even if I, um, even if my own daughter, mm, she yes. were to steal, yes. and also we go to an entire court case, it doesn't happen, mm. straight, but if she were to be you know, proven that she had stolen, mm. uh, then even True. I would yeah. keep her hand off, basically. Mm. So the rule of law is established for every single person and nobody's above the law. Hmm. So we shouldn't be you know, scared and this is the notion which we get fed on television hmm. by giving images of uh, states, failed states basically, like states like Afghanistan mm -hmm. where there were certain token aspects of Islam, that's it. So you know, just because people, the Azan could be heard aloud and namaz, people are going towards namaz and, and a few things of, of burqa, that doesn't really mean that this is a society which is based on Islam. Mm -hmm. Because we have to measure, we have to measure the society that is based on Islam on many other aspects, on many mm -hmm. other tenets itself. But the Western world uses these images for its own purposes. So going back to the point we mentioned about this kind of like this worldview between why can we say, you know, use a religion versus the West? Mm. It should be geography, isn't it? West mm. versus East. Now, if I were to say it a bit more, you know, uh, correctly, I'd say it's capitalism versus Islam. So a capitalist worldview <coughs> led by leading states like America, Britain, Germany, France, where they have a, a specific worldview and uh, want to establish a world order based upon their world vision. So what it means, how they want to shape the economy, what should be the, the measure for trading between countries, uh, you know, 
what should rights be, you know, what should the, the uh, roles of men and women be. So this is their worldview. Islam has its own wor worldview. And to be honest, we were talking about stuff about liberalization and Islamization. Mm -hmm. It's today is the anniversary of the destruction of the Khilafah so state. Yes. Na exactly 92 years mm -hmm. ago, on mm -hmm. this day, mm -hmm. Turkey was set on a liberalization path by the Western powers mm -hmm. by installing a puppet regime mm -hmm. uh, uh, under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Mm -hmm. The same uh, person who Musharraf said that I adore him. I, this is the person who I uh, want to emulate and want to establish his principles inside Pakistan. And that's where his idea of Roshan Khayali, enlightened moderation, came from. Mm -hmm. So what did Ataturk do? He fractured the entire Muslim world. Mm -hmm. So we talk about a worldview. Islam had a worldview. It had territories which spanned from the east to the west. Um, and um, I had um, many countries uh, under its ruling. So he managed, they managed to break this by making people believe that a western philosophy for their societies is actually better than Islam mm -hmm. itself. Islam is problematic. Islam doesn't allow women to move forward. Islam's rulings are too outdated. And therefore we need something new. How come is that the Muslim world hasn't produced you know, the next steam engine or the next computer? Okay. Whilst the Western world is making breakthroughs in, uh, breakthrough in sciences, is because Islam and its dogmatic worldview doesn't allow progress. Therefore, limit it to a personal domain, and everything else must be Westernized. And that's, that's the result of the Muslim world that we have today, where 92 years on after the destruction of the Khilafah, can any one single state that was formed after that, so from one state to over 50 states, can any one example be put forward? of this is the country which we can say that yes, it's on the road for economic, political, social progress. I was to ask you, um, you know, I want to come back to um, the concept of the Khilafat. Um, yes, because I was aware that 92 years. Shanaz, if I was to come back to you uh, on the, uh, the, 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 the concept of women, um, is it possible that women are afraid because they feel that interpretation of certain kind of Islam would put them back at home behind you know the kitchen is that the fear because that's what I was feeling when I went and asked I was talking to women that they feel <coughs> that their their um, freedom will be impinged I think that, uh, I think women and men need to fear uh, interpretations of the Quran and I think they need to fear it in the sense that we must take responsibility for an understanding of what is the truth. But is that fear real or is that <coughs> I um, think it does. regurgitated I think, by certain kind of media machinery? I think there is a certain kinds of media machinery that, mm. uh, that takes it to a level that perhaps isn't real. Mm. I think there is that and, and uh, we are all have an equal role to play in that if you look at social media and the things that the topics that people because are talking about this week. Because you've got, week. got Daesh, That's haven't right. you? Yes, yes. Mm. So I think that there is, a, there is a real fear. But I think also it's, it's to do with the fact that we ourselves are not comfortable with our own understanding. Um, if we go back to our connections there with Pakistan and what's happening there, I think the experience that, that the Muslim woman experienced in Pakistan is different yet not to that different to an average woman's experience in Britain in the sense that we are still stuck within cultural religious ideology and we're not able to separate the two. A state, any kind of state, whether it be a state uh, of Islam um, uh, and uh, if we follow a particular faith, what is our deen, it gives us parameters, it gives us um, rules, regulations and uh, an ideology that we follow uh, and that's very clear. That's very clear in what, what is right, what is wrong, and that is then governed or there is a certain aspect that is then there transparent within law. Now, if we don't have an understanding of that or we don't buy into that, where do we fit into that? And I think that is the issue and that is the fear, that because of certain interpretations um, of Islam within a country, say, for example, your experience with those women in Pakistan, uh, that, that is what it is. But I think it's more, more to do with the fact that the role that they play in that. If you look at the people that govern that kind of ideology or make it happen or have a say in the law and order, because it's ultimate the law and order that w will then imprint well, on their lately lives. Lately we have ha seen. Yes. Have seen then what happens uh, uh, if they are not part of that or that they don't feel that they have a voice or a role to play in that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that is more of an issue there. 
Yeah, yeah, and we've seen um, certain certain kind of uh, difficulties recently uh, in Pakistan. Six million dollar question. Do you think Pakistan can be saved by having the Islamization rather than liberalization? Do you think Pakistan can be saved? Or is this another long journey <coughs> we have to take? It's a journey that's going to take some time. Because it's, we can't zap it from outer space. That's can right. We? But what we can see, there's enough trends and there's enough evidences available to, to suggest that people strongly believe that the Islamic way of life can produce better results for running Pakistan. Why? Because they've seen the two sides of uh, democracy, democracy and dictatorship. There's two sides of the same coin. What there happens? Is, but, but seriously, there is. There, but, is, there isn't. Are we saying that there's democracy in Pakistan? No, I'm not, I'm not saying. No, no, it, yeah. Because I mean, seriously, we're military rule. Yeah. But they've got a parliament. They've yeah. got a, a, a legislative body. They've got elected members. So icing on cake. Yeah. What is consistent? Yeah. So. Whether, you know, as Musharraf used to say, we don't, we wanna, we don't want a sham democracy, we want a real democracy. Mm. Democracy is democracy at the end of the day, whether it's real or whether it's sham. Mm. You know, the US, uh, you know, democracy and the UK democracy is not exactly a vibrant democracy as we can see ourselves in this country mm. itself. Mm. We live it, we breathe every single day. We know what ha what's happening with politics and the corruption and the scandals and the arms deals and the, you know, uh, paying under the, uh, the, 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 under the table and the deals that go through. So we're all aware about that. So... Let's not kind of like, you know, uh, dwell too much on that. But these two ideas of democracy, dictatorship, uh, martial law, they've tried and tested everything. What's worked? Nothing. What they haven't tested at the moment is actually a, the, the running of that society mm. based on Islam. So, for example, if we just detail some of these issues, you know, 50% of the, the lands in Pakistan are not being used properly at the moment. Which law in the current... La or the last decade have, has been issued to suggest let's get these lands back on track again. Despite that fact, Pakistan is the sixth largest world uh, agricultural producer. According to the Islamic uh, ahkam, mm. which will be applied, if a land is left derelict for three years, then that land will be confiscated off that person because they haven't used it productively and will be given to somebody who can use it. Now, what, what happens there? How much poverty do we have in Pakistan? How many people do we have who are ready to... Mm to, to you know, uh, sow, reap and not the rewards of tilling a land and getting the produce from there and then selling it on there. So you're creating employment mm -hmm. and at the same time you are making productive 50, 50 you know, like a percent of the lands in Pakistan which not even been But used. if that was done, then what Shana said earlier, you wouldn't have those elites, would you? Which is, the, which is why they, mm -hmm. they really push forward mm -hmm. this idea that Islam is problematic. You don't really want Islam because obviously their own seats are at stake. Mm -hmm. Their own careers are at stake at the moment. So that's why what they do, they play with Islam. Mm. So Nawaz Sharif can introduce a 16th Amendment Sharia, Sharia Bill in the 90s. Why? Why did he do that for? Because he has to do some of these things. Otherwise, how is he going to appease the various you know, uh, factions in Pakistani society? So he has to appease the military. He has to appease the religious parties and the religious individuals who themselves, to be honest, are not doing any service to the Islamic call and the call for Khilafah in Pakistan specifically and saying, do you know what? We don't want to be part of a setup which fractures the implementation of Islam. You know, where you have to have a compromise and have a, you have to kind of like, you know, ride two fronts all the time. Why not go full back? So that's one rule I talked about there, number one. Number two, accountability. Everybody knows that only Islam will make the uh, rulers accountable. And there's strict punishments if they, if, they were to, uh, if they were to fault themselves or to fault the people there. Uh, number two. So number three, we're looking at uh, how a country would deal with men and women. And Islam is quite clear and specific that even women will have a healthy political life. Islam doesn't say that you can't become a judge and that you can't become somebody who, you know, who implements or executes Islamic law and hears cases. We need people. We need women who are going to be dentists, who are going to be doctors, who are going to be optometrists. Who's going to lead these services for women? We need people in the hospitals. We need people who are, ad who are to, to ta carry out administrative yeah. tasks inside um, uh, the various uh, political bodies and the infrastructure that the Islamic State requires for it to run. So this is uh, an, uh, an idea which is sold, to be honest, which is a, which is a, which is a big lie, uh, especially by the elite 
we try to convince that all they're going to do is put you into a burqa and leave you in the home. Mm -hmm. That is actually wrong. Well, this is what I was. Well, this is what I need to. I mean, I agree with Majid. Yeah. It's, as what I said at the beginning, as a Muslim woman, I have no fear of Islam. I know that my, my haq is there, my haqqoq will be there. Uh, and then the, the only thing, the scaremongering and the fear that it's created, and it's not created just in the Western world, it's there created by those that wish for it to be created. And I think the, the, the real um, issue that we have in, in countries like that is, is the issue of power, the issue of power and control. And as Marjorie has, has said, is that when it fits, they will bring in a, a law, a law that suddenly that they've divided. That law was there. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that law is not a, a new law. It just happens to be that you put it on a piece of paper and hand it over to the, uh, pr probably to an elite minority who have no true understanding of it anyway. Yeah, it, it just reminded me that recently I saw somewhere, uh, I think it's a, it's a divorce law that, yeah. uh, it, am I correct that... Uh, you cannot get married. No, you don't need your wife's permission to get, to marry again or have a second wife. I've, I mean, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, <laughs> I shouldn't be talking to you about this. I know. But, to me about it. <laughs> but did you hear about it? Unless, I mean, I've misunderstood, but I think I saw somewhere he said, you don't actually need. <clears throat> well, it's not a new concept, Anjum, mm -hmm. depending upon which school of thought you belong to. I and just want to know use by And your <laughs> own uh, understanding of it, Anjum. Uh, yeah. there, uh, there is evidence to suggest. Uh, and and, and I, I'm not a Muslim scholar, and I'm yeah. sure my brothers and sisters out there, uh, ulimas and alimas, uh, will, will, will say this. When you look at it from that perspective, there are examples. Uh, no, there's schools just of thought that, uh, that, yes, it, quite, that, that they, they, it could be argued. Yeah. It could be argued that you do not need permission. And this is what the Western, this is what the Western world will pick up, won't it? This is because exactly it suits them, Anjum. Because it suits them. It suits them. And again, again it's scaremongering, and it, and it suits them. Yet when you look at the rights of women in this country uh, and recently there uh, i'm talking 2016 i'm talking march 2016 uh, there was a debate on one of the uh, national uh, tv programs about uh, still the, the divide uh, and oh, the yes, differences the between divide. the gender divide in terms yes. of wages yes, of now course. if we live in a truly democratic society where we value people uh, not based upon their gender ethnicity sexuality etc uh, etc et uh, then then why is it why is it that they haven't got it right mm -hmm. And they haven't got it right because often, um, uh, off, not, not just often, but the reality is that there still is a tick box exercise that is going on behind, behind the scene. And they're, they're trying to please, uh, please the people out there. So how is that different to somewhere like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh? It isn't very different. It isn't. It isn't. But if I can just go back to the point, uh, something that was you said can, about we're capitalism. Going to a break, but we're going can. to break. <laughs> just a quick one. Yeah. Is that... Um, you know, the, the masses, who do we vote for? Who are the people that decide? Uh, so who, come back who, to that vote one bit. Yeah, who, who, do, who, who decides? And, and, and if we live in a truly democratic society, then you and I decide. Now, if we, you and I are in that majority who decide to vote for a particular party or a particular person, in some cases it ends up being a particular person, a personality, then that is a majority but what do they really understand by that, that, that right that they have? So, are you saying that the voting system doesn't work? I'm saying it'd be interesting because something I'm very interested in that I hope that we will be covering is looking we, at the EU referendum that's going to be coming up in the I, Well, that, that's next week's topic. Yes. Please don't go away. Join me back within the next few minutes when we take up and ask, will Pakistan do better under Khilafat? Don't go away now. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. That was very much Islamization or liberalization of the Muslim world. And we've talked about things that are happening in the Muslim world. We've particularly looked at uh, uh, Pakistan. But I want, Majid, I just want to ask that we've had Arab Spring, okay, which was for democracy. Has there been much change? No, Has liberalization <coughs> helped the Arab world? Actually, most commentators who look at this issue mm. retrospectively now, uh, they've got to agree that you know, no, no major change happened. So Egypt is a classic example of this. <coughs> so you had somebody in, in power for the last 40 years, Mubarak, or 30 years, I think it was, 30 years, mm. 30 years of power. 
uh, with the iron fist. In came the Arab Spring, he got ousted, and then it was uh, an event which uh, was, I think, which was, which you can say quite nicely, which was um, blessed by the US, blessed by Hillary Clinton, who actually went there and said, Look, do you know what, we need to have a setup which we are, we're actually in favor of as well. So he had <clears throat> General Sisi come in, and then he had, so before Sisi, then he had the elections took place, and the election outcome wasn't conducive for America, wasn't conducive for you know, Europe. Mercy. Yeah. Mercy wasn't conducive. Mm. So then what happened, then he had General Sisi pop in and mm. said, do you know what? The, there's been it's a, not a working. couple of irregularities here. There's been a couple democracy of... Democracy uh, isn't working. Dem uh, mm. Democracy isn't working. Or true democracy is not, is not play at the moment. And they, they took him out of uh, power and uh, he's been in ever since. So right under our noses, we can see Libya, we can see various other countries mm -hmm. where they were pushed towards you know, this whole idea that you, know, we're gonna, you can oust your dictators who we've supported for the last three to four decades. We've supported Gaddafi, we've backed Mubarak. We, in fact, Tony Blair used to go to holiday in Sharm el-Sheikh mm -hmm. uh, and meet Mubarak there. So these guys have been causing you to go up to dictators and now we've been lectured that, do you know what, actually they're not good for you. Democracy is the best route for you there. Because why? They want an outcome which they can dictate. They could dictate the outcome with the Gaddafi, they can dictate the outcome with Saddam to a certain extent until he turned. Uh, they can uh, dictate the terms of how that country should be run and you know what access it should have to their oil reserves and the various the natural resources that they have available there and how British and American companies can you know yield the profits and take them back to their countries. Now once they can manage the outcome, uh, they then had to think of plan B and that was to create uh, some sort of a, uh, a ideal that you know uh, people believed that they were they were having some sort of democratic chain and moving toward liberalization and it's there in front of you, the picture. So it's not working. You know, just before break we said, and this is a hypothetical question of course, we talked about the Khilafat movement and we're not talking about the Daesh Khilafat movement, we're not talking about that. Can it work for Pakistan? Or is that a, it's a far-fetched idea? It can. That's the, a theory. The number it's one, a theory. Yeah, the number one reason I'll give you straight away. Mm. Now, 1998, Madeleine Albright, who was then the Secretary of State, she said this is one area that the US hasn't really focused on since Zia went, basically. And it's a volatile state. It's uh, turned into a nuclear power. This is the 90s, late mm. 90s. And uh, there's strong Islamic sentiment. These were her, her exact words. What happened after 9-11? is Pakistan became the frontline state out of all the Muslim countries in the war on terror. And, and obviously... It paid a price. Yeah, it paid a price, definitely. And all the wrong decisions were made uh, by the then uh, uh, ruler at the time, Pervez Musharraf, who let in you know, uh, an aggressor state take over a lot of issues to do with the foreign policy of Pakistan. And since then, Pakistan has been paying the price. Terrorism, uh, you know, the influx of you know, suicide bombings. There was none of these prior to 9-11, prior to 9-11 or prior to the US invasion of Afghanistan, which happened through a proxy state like Pakistan itself there then. So Pakistan was used and abused, and we were made up to feel that, do you know what, this is going to be in the interest of Pakistan, they will solve the Kashmir dispute, they will, you know, hear us more on the UN assemblies, and you know, we will have a lot more economic liberalization because we will allow to be trade more, we will have a more of a softer image in the international arena. Nothing happened, they actually all the reverse happened after that there then. So, uh, this area is of great interest to the US and to the UK. They know full well the potential of Pakistan. In fact, if you study the mm. University of Punjab research that they did, that there's enough gas reserves mm. for the next 200 years in Pakistan. Mm. And as I mentioned earlier on about the, uh, the, um, the agriculture, there's no mineral that doesn't grow in Pakistan. There's no mineral that doesn't grow in Pakistan. Subhanallah. It's absolutely amazing. So Allah Ta'ala has blessed this nation, blessed this particular land with lots of resources. What it needs now is a new ideological and political vision, which we believe comes from Islam and is then uh, erected on the principles of the system of Khilafah, basically. We have a track record of a Khilafah state which lasted for 1300 years, from the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right up to the Ottoman Caliphate, Ottoman Khilafah itself there then. So we're not talking about something which we've just kind of plucked out from the air and said maybe it, work, maybe it might not work. Uh, everybody remembers the track record of uh, the Khilafah state, of how it was the leading uh, uh, state for education, it was the leading state for you know, uh, science, discoveries. How did that come? Was that just a 
kind of come out by, by, by chance? Or was it a product of an Islamic civilization where Islam was the cornerstone for every single thought mm. of you know, producing excellence in that society? That people could be challenged, the Khalifa, the ruler, the wali, anybody could be challenged in the area and they could be removed from office. Where a woman could walk from one country or one part of the state to another, mm. not fearing anything else apart from the attack of a wolf. Mm. So, and women, you know, in terms of trade and, you know, commerce, you know, they were there at the front. And what was Europe in? Europe was in the dark ages. They were debating whether women had a soul or not. That was them. So we live in an era now where we are being told that, you know what, more religion is actually going to take you back to that era mm. where, where people in, in this country were debating whether women had souls or not. Mm. They try to um, stamp on us their experiences. The thing is, Islamic experience and the Christian experience very different, is very completely different, different experiences politically. And how can women contribute to this idea, uh, utopia? How can women? How can women help? I think women need to engage themselves uh, in that debate, and I think women need to engage themselves in that debate uh, in in a position. Uh, where but if you were having this be... conversation in Pakistan, you'd be, wouldn't you be locked up? Because I no, know I wouldn't be locked people. up. No, I wouldn't be you locked wouldn't be up. And I, and I think, and I think, is that notion? I'm going to send you over to Pakistan to have this no conversation. No problem. I go to Pakistan <laughs> on a regular basis, uh, and I, ha I have no fear when, when when I travel Pakistan because I know the parameters that are, that I can work in. I believe that uh, there is enough scope. Um, within Pakistan in terms of the cultural and the religious implications that any woman has in any, in any state. Uh, and I also uh, believe that uh, I, I have an understanding of what those rules and regulations are. Now, put that aside and looking at women in general, right? I think they need to engage, and I think they need to engage, uh, uh, not just for the sake of it, but they need to engage in an intelligent conversation. And I think there needs to be people there who listen from both sides. And the women that do talk, they, do, they shouldn't be labelled as uh, those uh, so-called, even liberalisation in itself has very negative connotations attached to it. Just as westernisation has negative connotations attached to it, just as Islam has negative connotations attached to it, we need to remove all those barriers. And I think we need to go back to what we said at the beginning, there needs to be a fresh, open, honest debate. And I think once we do that and we engage people... Can you have an honest, open debate in Pakistan? Yes. Can you talk about things like blasphemy? Yes. No? Why not? So. Why, Anjum? Why is it that we believe what is portrayed within the media? Because well, it's not the just media. media. No, it's, it's not, not just, just media. media. Because it's, there are certain topics which are closed. Well, there are certain topics that are closed within this country. Where can you go? Can you, you're saying to so me, what no, we're I, saying basically, nowhere in the world do we have freedom of speech. It's a fallacy. I think it's a, a, an ideology that we all strive towards. But we don't have freedom no, of speech. We don't. We don't. You, are you telling me that you can, we're in Blackburn, are you telling me that you can walk into a, a, a masjid here, a local one, because we're in Blackburn, let's just pick on Blackburn, for, for, you know, uh, and have that debate? Can Majid walk into a mosque and have that debate? Are you really telling me that we can do so that? So we don't have total freedom of speech as such. It doesn't exist anywhere. No. So it's dictated. It's di dictated uh, by a, a number of things. And, and one, uh, you have law and order. Mm -hmm. uh, you have respect. So how are we going to else? indulge in this difficult conversation uh, uh, in Pakistan? How do we do that? Just as you would do it here, Anjum. And that is starting with the premise that uh, this is my view. Mm -hmm. And I am not here to upset somebody. Yeah, but you have a crowd mentality, don't you? Yes, but how is that created? Who but, is that crowd? But, but what I'm just saying is that the crowd mentality can cause... So problems. why is it, Anjum, then? Why is it that in this week, we're not mentioning any names, that the country has been divided? Mm. Right. If that was the case, Anjum, the country would not be divided. There would be a certain either this way or that way that they would either follow uh, the decision that has been made by a Supreme Court mm. from 2000, an incident that happened in 2011 to, to the actual what we see in 2016 as a result of that, a decision that's been made in, in a court, not behind some closed doors, right? So why is it that the country is divided? Because we have that freedom to express ourselves. Why is it that, it, 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 that there, are, there, is a, there is a split in opinion? I'm not c totally convinced that it is. Uh, I, I think it's still a crowd mentality. Um, but I could be wrong. But I where does the crowd wrong. come from and who are the leaders? Yeah. I think if you even look at 
how these debates need to take place. Again, I talked about the, in the beginning about construct, these mm -hmm. terms that are constructed and we're kind of limited already in our discussion. That's what mm -hmm. happens then. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we are kind of like bullied into just thinking within know, one yeah. sphere. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this uh, report which came out uh, called uh, Civil Democratic Islam. is mm -hmm. by the Rand Institute. And what they did, they, they decided to... This is their opening... What's the report called again? Uh, Civil Democratic Islam. So this is what they said, this is our opening introduction. The Islamic world is involved in a struggle to, to determine its own nature and values with serious implications for the future. What role can the rest of the world, threatened and affected as it is by the struggle, play in bringing about a more peaceful and positive outcome? Mm -hmm. So the Western world believes that they will lead the, the way forward in defining what type of Islam is acceptable and mm -hmm. what is not acceptable, mm -hmm. according to their worldview. So what they decided to do is they decided to split Muslims up into categories. So they said there's a fundamentalist, there's a traditionalist, there's a modernist and there's a secularist. Okay. So who can we engage with? So what does the traditionalists believe in? What are their kind of red lines? What are the conservatives? What do they believe in? What are their red lines? And they looked at various issues. So they looked at democracy, they looked at hijab, they looked at crime and punishment, they looked at various issues and tried to construct you know the various views that these people would bring. So what they do then is they define don't the debate. Don't lose the track. Yeah. But just don't lose the track. We're going to take this call. Brother Ali from Birmingham. As salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as salam. As salamu alaykum, sir. Wa alaykum as salam. Ji, sir. Oh, may I, can you speak in Urdu? Sorry? Can I speak in Urdu? Ji, ji, aap uh, farmaiye. Baat ye hai ke ye mein api lagaya hai. Laga hua hai ki aap is ke liye baat kar rete ki freedom speech ke baat mein. Ji, ji. Ye freedom speech ki pabandi kehen bhi nahi thi. कहीं भी नहीं थी कर सकते थे बात मगर जो हमारे सबरा हैं ये इनके गुलाम हो गए यहूदी लाबी के इसलिए हम लोगों को नीची नजर से देखते हैं कि ये मुसलमान हैं इसलिए अगर दुनिया में मेरी जुबान और बात काटने नहीं जाने देना दुनिया में इंटरनेशनल लैंग्वेज इन्होंने अंग्रेजी रखी हुई है जो अरबी होनी चाहिए थी कि और हमारे जितने भी इस्लामी मुल्क हैं कितने मुल्क में इस्लामी कानून चल रहा है किसी में है किसी ने भी नहीं जो सऊदी जिसको हम जिसके जाते हैं हज के लिए सिर्फ दो जगह वहां पर मुकद्दस जगह है उसके अलावा वहां पर सब देखो ये सब वर्शिप किसकी करते हैं यहूदियों की वो भी हुकूमत हमारी पाकिस्तानी हुकूमत हम दोनों से वास्ता है दूसरे तो दिखाई नहीं देते क्या कर रहे हैं पाकिस्तानी हुकूमत को देखो वो क्या कर रहे हैं वो सीधे साधे यहूदी लाबी है मानो या ना मानो कोई भी पाकी आए तो हमारी कदर कहां होगी फ्रीडम स्पीच की कहां कदर होगी जब हम गुलामी शुरू कर देंगे दुनिया में दुनिया में दुनिया में सलाम है सलाम सलाम से खुद मुसलमान भी डरते हैं हमारे सबरा सब सलाम से डरते हैं किसी से पूछो कि कोई हमें तलावत करके बताए किसी को आती नहीं ये नाम के मुसलमान हैं थैंक यू सो मच ये हमारे लोग देखो ये हमारे जो टीवी के कुछ स्टेशन है वो भी खरीदे हुए उन्होंने Thank you. Ali, oh, sorry, are you still, are you still there? Oh, I'm so sorry, Ali, bhai. You have phone karega, like the line drop. Jazakallah khair, you've um, uh, highlighted some uh, good points. Sorry, you're coming, I'm coming back to you. You're on point two, I think, with reference yeah. to the report. <clears throat> yeah, with reference yeah. to the report. So, uh, all I'm trying to kind of uh, um, say here is that uh, when we're cornered and we, our discussion is limited to certain concepts and we are asked to define ourselves based on those, we can't do that. So that's why I said that at the beginning, liberalization or Islamization, both of these terms, even Islamization is coined by the Western world. Mm. So therefore we need to kind of, uh, uh, kind of arise above that and uh, you know when we have incidences like in Pakistan today, mm. you know this is, you know, uh, it's quite an odd case that took place. Mm. but. Um, there's been many incidents in the history of Pakistan where they've tested the waters of what do the the population actually feel like towards certain issues. Mm -hmm. So whether it yeah. is allowing the US to come into their country and mm -hmm. you know, take over and do certain things and do operations, mm -hmm. can they allow them to do that, can they not? And at the moment you can see that the US is building a more of a softer image in Pakistan by saying, look, we're defeating terrorists. Look what we've done over here, we've you know, assassinated this person, we've assassinated that person. Mm -hmm. But also at the very same time, they've introduced the Popa Act, which is I think the Protection of Pakistan Act, where anybody can be picked up under just a suspicion that you know this person Sounds has ideas 
which yeah. are counterproductive to the ideology of the state itself. And this is happening. Mm -hmm. People from different groups, Islamic groups and various other groups as well, are being picked up mm -hmm. and they don't know where these individuals are. This is what I was trying stop. to say to you, Shana. But that is, that is frightening. That's exactly what I was trying to say, that mm. I know for a fact. Is it uh, Dr. Butt? But? Who was picked up some years ago? Yeah, Navid Bhatt. Right, yeah. Navid, Dr. Navid yeah. Bhatt, who was picked up, and nobody seems to know where, where he is. But, but that's because, that that's that when because people speak up, you're picked up. But that is because we have allowed Big Brother, American Big Brother, and other Big Brothers, yeah. to come in and to take control of the rule and order. The political parties that we've had, whether they be dictators or so-called democratic leaders, they've allowed that to happen. Now, the, the control has to go back into the people, the people yeah, of the state. How is that going to happen? But we're going to come back, I think, Brother Ali. Assalamu alaikum, Ali bhai. Wa alaikum salam. Ji, maaf ki jiga, line drop ho gai. Ji, aap farma raha te? Main ye farma raha tha ki kuch hamare jo TV station hai, wo bhi bike hu hai. इन इन ये नलाबियों ने खरीदे हुए हैं सच को वो भी बताने से शर्माते हैं क्योंकि कल परसों वो दूसरा आप ममताज भाई का जो पाकिस्तान में अच्छा जी बहुत बहुत अली भाई को इंटरफेरेंस है लाइन पे आई एम सो सॉरी व्हाट इज़ अबाउट हेलो हाँ जी हाँ जी तू बात नहीं आ रही क्या बात है जी जज़ाकल्ला ख़ I think the lines dropped again. I I'm think sorry. the point that uh, uh, Ali Bai made in terms of, um, the, you know, he gave the example of freedom of speech and what's happening within the, within the TV stations. Mm -hmm. I, th I think is a valid one in the sense that how how do people make decisions? They make decisions upon one is what they what they, the ideal thing that they wish to do. Either they fight for a cause or they fight for, uh, say, a, a political party or a, an actual mm. whatever's happening at that moment in time or what's happening over a period of time. But then how how can they make those decisions when the financial situation or the political situation or the social situation is not in their favour? Mm. So then what happens? Who who then dictates that? So say for example, I wish to purchase something I'm going to have myself certain constraints aren't I mm. on my financial on my social and even maybe to do with my gender as to whether I can or cannot do that mm. then with the, then were all the things that everybody has to juggle when you go when you sort of look at that from from a say from a very domestic point of view I an individual point of view then you look at it from uh, a state point of view and then from a global point of view that is exactly what's happened they have allowed people to come in to their world and dictate upon them what they can and so it's cannot a system. do. So it's a system that it's has a gone wrong. It's a broad system. It's a system that has gone wrong. And this is what I think Majid was trying to say, that if the system is not right, you can put anybody on the chair. It would make no difference. The system. Because if you're going to operate the system which is incorrect, mm -hmm. then the, res the outcomes will, not ma you know, will be incorrect too. Is that, is that what yeah, you... Yeah, I mean, if they've mm. tried in Pakistan, how many times have they brought in a certain figure to back up the president or back up the prime minister? Mm. We had one point where we had one individual called Rafiq Darar who had a white beard, uh, a nice top in his head, a Shirwani. Yes, and yes, they yes. tried to put faces up like this mm. um, to appease the population that, look, somehow, you know, we're looking after everybody. You know, we are a Muslim nation. Mm. But in reality, it's, um, the, it's, it's a stark mm. difference to what we mean by uh, a country being ruled by Islam and what they actually have on for offer at the moment there. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, the, the tide is changing in that country because they've lived through experiences now. They've lived through, like, the military dictatorship, democracies, uh, and dictatorship, di dictatorships as well. And none of them have worked. None of them have produced any prosperity for that country. None of them have really defined any key set roles for both men and women. Mm. Both feel still vulnerable. Poverty hasn't been eradicated in that country. Education, literacy hasn't been addressed uh, in any you know radical shape or form, mm. so what in, what happens at the end of the day? What do people believe that these governments they they're doing is simply just uh, playing their role, uh, uh, lining up their pockets and uh, supporting uh, an aggressive nation, which is basically killing their own population. Mm. So what we should do is say, look, okay, what is the way forward from here? We would say, quite frankly, is this Islamic? can Islam save the Muslim, not just the Muslim world? Can Islam save the world? Yes, it can. I mean, right from the onset, when mm. we look at the <coughs> introduction of Islam to this world through Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he mentioned, you know, why do you bury your daughters alive? That wasn't to a Muslim. Mm. That was to a human hey. being. Mm. You know, addressing their consciousness, addressing their humanity. What's wrong with you guys? Mm. Mm. You know, how can you do such a thing? How can it be even acceptable? Mm. You know, why do you fight wars? And you don't you know why you're even fighting each other? Mm. You shed blood. Mm. 
and you don't know why you even do that. How do you treat women? You know, why do you treat the underclass mm-hmm. as you know, a wiser slavery? Mm-hmm. So Islam came and addressed all of these societal problems from the point of view of solving human problems. Mm-hmm. So when we look at any world issue, Islam has a solution for Brazil, the poverty in Brazil. Islam has a solution for the 330 million people living in poverty in India Mm -hmm. and how it will eradicate poverty. Islam has a view about uh, how the role of women should be in for for Africa, Mm -hmm. where women are not seen, you know, as the same uh, as men or whatever. Mm -hmm. So Islam has a a world view. Like I said, capitalism has a world view and it offers solutions and choices to people. Communism did the same thing as well, but it evolved as as a world power and said, look, we have a better solution than capitalism. Capitalism will exploit you, mm-hmm. we will share your resources. Now, on the, the same level, Islam has a worldview and did have a worldview, which is why a lot of the Western countries don't like it coming back again. Majid, as always, I listen to you very intently. Just very quickly, literally 15 seconds. Do you believe, as a Muslim woman, that Islam is the way forward? I think Islam is the only way forward. There's no question in my mind. And just as Majid has said, uh, is that it has a solution for everything. It has a recognition and a solution for everything because it looks at it from a human perspective and, and our own uh, responsibilities, shared responsibilities uh, that we have, not just with ourselves, with our families, with our communities, but the global sense. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. Certainly the decision from our two panel members that the only way forward is not Islamization, it's not democratization, it's not liberalization, but it's very much going back to our roots. And that, that, that is faith and Islam in its honesty. We need a lot more religious literacy. We need to understand. Um, and yes, of course, mistakes are made um, all over the world. And not forgetting that Pakistan is going through tough times too. Let's pray for Pakistan and for the rest of the world. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Shanars. Thank you, Majid. And uh, of course, uh, to you who have allowed us to come into your homes without being asked, of course. Look after yourself and your neighbor, whoever they may be. And until next week, remember me in your duas. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.